I'll like have that idea or like realize, oh, that's the person I need to reach out to. It's a or cliche, I should have asked this question. But you really start uh, with the people you know. A few and, months uh, ago now about about a woman named Sandra Bland. Mm -hmm. I think, well, I think for me, I've always had, a, growing up, a problem with authority. So I wasn't very good at, at having people say, you know, you have to do this and get in line and, and do this this way. So I've always, I've always had this sort of inherent problem with it. But when you marry that with, um, I think, empathy toward things that just aren't right, that shouldn't be happening, the two together tend to make like a great mixture to create investigative journalists. Okay, so I'm Laura Sullivan, and I am a correspondent for NPR. I do investigative projects for NPR. Now, right now, I'm also a correspondent for Frontline. So I've been trying to meld the world of radio and television together, and it's been interesting. When you think about investigative journalism, you generally think about documents, things that you have FOIA'd from the Department of Defense, lots of email chains and, and things that would never in a million years make good radio. And there's nothing you can do about that, except in how you tell the story. So if you come at it from a different perspective and how you change the shape of the story, the structure of the story, it can alter the way people understand those facts and that information. One of the times that I think that I first attempted to tackle sort of an idea that came from, you know, FOIA documents and, and um, sort of heavy pieces of information was this idea of, of solitary confinement in, in U.S. prisons and the high use of it and what it was doing to the inmates, to taxpayers and to the prison system, right? And it was basically like a fundamentally failed structure and process that was happening. So as I'm going through this tour, though, I'm not, I'm not, fully aware of what my story is. So I don't, I don't know what the point of my investigation is, which is always something you want to know before you walk out the door. So I get into this prison and I'm not really sure, and I'm doing this classic problem of saying, I don't know, I'm hoping you'll kind of tell me as we're walking around what my story's about, or I'm hoping you'll kind of tell me what the point of my own story is, rather than knowing before I step in there, this is, I'm using this tour as a vehicle to explain what I already know the problem is. Lieutenant Troy Wood works in the psychiatric shoe. He says they treat mental illness by monitoring the inmates and sending them to what he and others call group therapy. This is how the PSU inmates receive their group therapy. Okay. Each one of these holding cells, there's a seat in there and this and that. In a small room, there are six metal cages the size of phone booths facing each other. There is one inmate locked inside, listening to a boom box. Depending on what the group is, you know, they'll either listen to music, watch movies, play games, uh, have art, uh, current events, um, a lot of different types of groups. So this is, this is group going on right now? Yeah, this is this is this what is actually. It's a music group. This, this music group right now. This inmate replies that this is in fact it's a reading group. group. Okay, on tape you can literally hear me uncomfortable. You can hear me saying, like, is this is this music group? <laughs> Like, I, there's this uncomfortable laughter. I am not anywhere near my microphone. And this entire story, all, every piece of this flawed state policy was coming to a head right there in this moment. And I knew it somewhere in my brain because I was uncomfortable and it was awful. And what I was seeing was awful. But I wasn't stopping and saying, this is where it comes to a head in my story. For me, one of these examples was a story that I did out of South Dakota about the, the number of, the absurdly high number of Native American children in white foster care. And I went, uh, you know, you have to drive hours in South Dakota, and we went out to, my producer Amy Walters and I went out to interview this, this Bureau of Indian Affairs officer whose job it was to, it was to really help people in this uh, situation, help families get their kids back. And we got out there and, I mean, this was like your worst nightmare of a bureaucrat on tape. 
I mean, I was sitting there thinking, this has been such a waste of time. I can't even use this tape. This guy's so boring. I'm about to shoot myself. Like, this is awful. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, it must really suck to have, you know, this guy, you know, being the only person who can help you if you're screwed and the state takes your kids. And then all of a sudden it finally clicks into my head and I'm thinking of the story and I think, wait a minute, it must really suck if you get your kids taken by the state and you got to depend on this guy to help you out. And all of a sudden I see him as part of the story because he is part of the problem. The state does have Native American foster homes. So uh, yeah, it's, it's working. But state records show only 13% of Native kids in foster care are placed in Native homes. In fact, Valandra admits that not one of the children in his almost three dozen cases is placed with a Native American family. So I asked him. Do you feel like maybe these children are, have been let down a little bit? Of my cases, I think they're all right now. How do I want to? The placement of the children right now are, are, uh, boy, that's. <laughs> Nothing speaks more to how underserved these people were than listening to this guy on tape sounding like the last person in the world who could help anybody. There are two questions. Why is this happening and who is responsible? And when you take the sad story, this terrible thing is happening, this group of people are being subjected to this, and you ask, why is that happening and who is responsible for it? You move the story into a whole other area. This area where you're saying to the public and to the audience, come with me on this. And I'm going to explain to you why this is happening, and then I'm going to place this at the feet of some person, some institution, some system that is responsible for it. And when you do that, these stories are eye-opening for people. And, and in some small way, they change the world.